Okay, guys, while you're having lunch, we're going to get started. We have a very interesting speaker. I'm sure you've all heard about him, Matt Bunch. He was in, uh, there was an article about Matt Bunch in Kansas City Star, actually. I think it was uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago. It was back in December. In December, there was an article about Matt Bunch in Kansas City Star. And uh, those of you who were here last year, you saw him talk for us, and he was at that time working for Powell Gardens. And now he has moved on. And uh, as you all know, he has been in the horticultural field for 20 years as a landscaper, as a nurseryman, as an arborist, and horticulturist. From 2004 to 2013, Matt was with Powell Gardens, like I just told you. While with Powell Gardens, he managed native plant landscapes and the Heartland Harvest Garden. I'm sure you've all seen the Heartland Harvest Garden. It's very beautiful. And that's one of the, uh, that's the nation's largest edible landscape. He's now with the Giving Grove, and that was what the Kansas City Star article was all about. That's a nonprofit program of Kansas City Community Gardens that supplies fruits and nut trees and orchard assistance to neighborhoods and communities around the Kansas City area. And today he's going to talk about growing fruits and nuts in the urban landscape. Thank you, Matt, for being here. Okay. Big well, round of applause for Matt. <clears throat> Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, if, you, if you haven't picked up a sheet and are curious, I do have a, a variety, uh, fruit variety and nut variety list, and it's uh, directly across from the water and iced tea over there. I don't have enough to go around for everybody. Um, if you don't get one and want one, uh, take my business card, email me, and I can send that list on. So, uh, yeah, I, I would uh, like to talk about fruits and nuts in the Kansas City area and, and basically uh, what varieties are going to do well for us. Um, there's, there's a lot out there, and there are so many different varieties of apples, pears, peaches, plums, but not everything grows in this area. So that is why I'm giving this talk. And, and uh, not only what grows in this area, but what is going to be disease resistant, what will be not pest resistant, but more pest resistant, uh, be able to tolerate some of the pests, uh, what grows well in our climate. Uh, we're in this sort of uh, wonderful transition zone here where we can grow so many different things from the East Coast, from the West Coast, from China, from, uh, from the Caucasus, we can grow an amazing amount of plant species, but we also have a lot of pest species, a lot of fungal diseases. Uh, we run the gamut. Everything grows well here. Um, and we also have a very difficult climate, too. Um, this year, we've, we've been challenged a little bit. It's been a, one of the coldest winters we've had in the past few. Uh, we also can have very hot summers. We can also have very cool springs. So, so this uh, presentation is here to, to help you decide what fruits and nut trees will actually grow well in the Kansas City area. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> the, uh, the, some of the principles of fruit tree culture. Uh, so so this, is, this is very important uh, when you're deciding on an orchard uh, or if, if it's in your own yard. Um, so site selection, do you have the six to eight hours of sun? Uh, really, eight plus hours is even better. Uh, how's your soil? Most of our soils are, are uh, kind of the clay gumbo. Um, and they're, they're also going to be uh, fairly alkaline. Uh, some, you know, neutral to alkaline. Uh, there are very few pockets of, of acidic soil in our area. Um, so, so look at that. Uh, fruit trees like well-drained. Uh, variety selection. So first off, uh, what varieties do you like to eat? Then whittle that down, realizing that the varieties you like to eat probably will not grow well here. So, so you whittle that down to maybe a variety that's going to be similar. Uh, having, having an enterprise apple maybe instead of a Macintosh apple, uh, something along those lines. Uh, don't, don't dare do Honeycrisp, uh, especially, if, especially if you're going, going to try to grow organically or biologically. Uh, Honeycrisp is just not suited around here, and many people have made that mistake. 
it's a wonderful apple in the grocery store. It's not a wonderful apple in your, in your yard or in your orchard. Uh, the next is buying trees. And uh, it, it can be sort of difficult uh, uh, finding fruit trees uh, around our area. You can go to nurseries, and yes, there will be fruit trees for sale at those nurseries. Uh, you need to know what rootstock your, your trees are going to be on. Are they going to be a semi-dwarf rootstock? Is it a dwarfing rootstock? But not only do you need to know what the rootstock is, if it's dwarf or semi-dwarf, you need to know, is it an M7? Is it a G16? Is it a G11? The, all of these numbers mean something. Uh, M26 is a rootstock that will not do well around here because it cannot tolerate clay or wet soils. So you need to know these things going into it. Oftentimes, um, if, if the nursery knows and they have records of that, that's great. Uh, honestly, you have to go online an, uh, an awful lot of the time in order to buy fruit trees. Uh, planting trees. You know, planting trees is, is, can be a very simple act, a very rewarding act. There are correct ways. There are a number of correct ways. There are also incorrect ways. And then uh, care and maintenance. And that's, that's really the biggest thing with fruit trees, is it's going to take you two to three, sometimes four years before you start realizing a harvest. You need to know what to do in those two to three to four years before the harvest, and then you need to know what to do once you start realizing a harvest. You need to go through the fruit thinning. You need to go through integrated pest management. Um, so that being said, uh, we'll get into some of the considerations for variety selection. So fruit quality and characteristics. Um, do you want early ripening? Do you want late ripening? So apples, we have a ripening time from basically early August all the way through late October. And we have a number of varieties in the Kansas City area that, that do well. Uh, that you could have that harvest for nearly two and a half months. Um, same with any of the other fruit crops, pears, peaches, etc. cetera. You, you sort of have long windows depending on the variety. Uh, pollinating requirements. Uh, notice the, the peaches. Um, peaches are self-fertile, so you do not need a pollinator. But uh, many of the other things, like, uh, like pears, like apples, you do need a pollinizing counterpart. Now, if you're doing, uh, doing apples in your yard, you can sometimes get away with one apple tree. Um, one apple tree can be pollinated by a crab apple that is 100 yards, 200 yards away. Crab apples serve as great pollinizers for apple trees. So if your neighbor has a crab apple, if you have a crab apple, uh, you can always rely on that crab apple supplying the pollen for your apple tree. Uh, bloom time is basically kind of saying the same thing when it comes to apples, pears, uh, but with peaches, you want to make sure your bloom time is going to be after the last frost. Now, you know, that, uh, that's sort of April 15th-ish around our parts, but as, as we've seen with last year, we, we had snow, we had cold temperatures, in early in the first week of May. So you, you want to make sure that your, your blossoms are going to be timed right, and also that the blossoms are going to be hardy. Uh, I don't really recommend apricots around here. Now, you can get great apricot crops, but you will not continually get good apricot crops. It's, it's sort of a, a one in five, one in seven, uh, one out of every five, one out of every seven years. Uh, rootstock, we, we talked about that. There's, uh, so so most, uh, most fruit trees are on either a semi-dwarf or a dwarfing rootstock. Um, this, this is something, um, there, there aren't too many full-size rootstocks out there, especially for apples. Now pears, that's another, another situation. But if, uh, if you want a dwarfing tree, it will stay at about the 8 to 10 foot level on apples. A semi-dwarf is going to be 15 to 18 feet. So just know what you're getting into. You'll get more production on the semi-dwarf, 
but you're, you're, you're sacrificing a whole bunch of space. Um, so just think about that. And then disease resistance. Um, and, and I bring apples into this because apples are probably the most, most important crop that people would be growing. Uh, you want to look at scab resistance. You want to look at fire blight resistance. Uh, and fire blight is, is also important in pears, too. And having resistant varieties of those uh, will go a long way to making sure that growing fruit is going to be successful for you. So uh, this, this sort of goes back to, to what I was saying about the, the pollination requirements. Apples, once again, if your neighbor has a crab apple, you'll be fine. Crab apples, their, their blossom time lasts, uh, it can last on good springs four to six weeks. Most of the time it's going to be two to three weeks. You will get overlap uh, with, with your apple tree. Uh, pears, uh, two varieties. There are a few exceptions, though. Uh, peaches, self-pollinating. Cherries, uh, depending on the variety, are self-pollinating. Um, I like to recommend the self-pollinating ones just so you don't have to have two. Uh, so black gold is a wonderful sweet cherry that is self-pollinating. And uh, Montmorency is a nice tart one. Uh, the Danube and the, and the Jubilium, which are a, uh, they're a cross between the sweet and tart cherries, are also uh, good self-pollinating varieties. Um, and then we get to apricots and plums, and I really don't want to talk too much about plums other than uh, a, as a professional uh, with the Giving Grove, we do not recommend plums because plums are actually uh, one, of the, one of the fruits that attracts an insect called the plum cucurlio. And once you have plum cucurlio in your orchard, it doesn't discriminate from plum, peach, or apple, or pear. So we just, we just try to circumvent that. So uh, a little bit about the, uh, the dwarfing rootstock. Um, and, and this goes back to, yes, nearly all fruit trees are grafted. Uh, that, that's just the, the way the industry has done it for a long time. You want to have a rootstock that's going to be hardy. You want a rootstock that is going to uh, be resistant to uh, aphids, you want it to be resistant to fire blight, etc. Um, but also you want to be able to have a rootstock that's going to control the size of your trees. And so the dwarfing rootstock is going to be about an 8 to 10 foot level on most of your apples. Um, on pears, you'll be lucky if you, you get something that's going to dwarf it by about a half to two thirds. And so then you're talking at about a 12 to 15 foot level. Now peaches, uh, there's no real dwarfing rootstock for our area. There's a, ver there's a red leaf rootstock that's supposed to dwarf in sandier soils because our soils are, are so rich in clay and clay holds a lot of nutrients. It doesn't work for, for us. So the peaches are still going to, to be at about that 15 to 18 foot level. Uh, there are tricks to pruning peaches to keep them a lot lower than that. And then, uh, once again, try to, try to purchase trees from nurseries that identify their rootstocks. And, and that's what I was saying about mail order, but I know more and more nurseries are becoming particular about the rootstock that they get in. Just a little bit of a size comparison here. So, uh, so you could either be out there with the, with the basket or the pole pruner on your, on your 20 foot, 25 foot apple tree, or you could be you know, basically right there just picking the apples right off. Uh, the background shows uh, a nice uh, espaliered form of, of an apple tree as well. And espaliering is a great way if you're tight on space run that up against your fence line, run it up against the house. Uh, wonderful way to cultivate fruit. Uh, really, apples and pears are suited quite well for doing that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't deal with it with cherries or, uh, or peaches, anything like that. They grow too robustly. And here are just, uh, just some different examples. Uh, with, with the pear tree, you see the, uh, the, the, uh, the candelabra shape. Uh, everything else is pretty much in a cordon shape right here. This is more 
uh, cordon to fan, pruned. Um, but yeah, yeah, so very attractive and very productive. So some of the apple varieties that, uh, that I'd, I'd like to recommend uh, are, are sort of the following here. Um, now as you get down towards the bottom of the list, uh, these are going to be less disease resistant apples, but still fairly, fairly tolerant of things like fire blight and apple scab. And you noticed Honeycrisp is not on there, Pink Lady is not on there. Uh, a lot of the varieties that you would see in the grocery store are not on there. Um, these are apples that are raised in Washington for the most part. Uh, and Washington is, is sort of blessed with a, a better climate for growing apples than we are. So, so we have to take into account things like apple scab, things like fire blight. And also if you're trying to grow in a biological organic type setting, um, really it's advisable not to use things like streptomycin on your apple trees. Even though it has been approved for organic use, uh, they're actually taking that off. So Asian pears, um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Asian pears. They, uh, they're not like a European pear. They're a rounded fruit, so you might initially think it's an apple if you were to see this at a supermarket or a farmer's market. Um, they, they are uh, the pyrus species. Uh, they, they just, they have a different, uh, basically the tree is a little bit different shape. It's still gonna be columnar, but not nearly as pyramidal. Um, and, and they put these fruits on that can be anywhere from sort of racquetball to, in some cases, baseball of a little larger size. Um, most of them always exhibit this sort of russeted skin. Uh, they have a very, uh, very crisp texture. Um, crisp te texture, nice sweetness. There are some that sort of have a caramel-like flavor when you bite into them. These are really well adapted to our area. Um, the varieties listed are all uh, fairly tolerant uh, to resistant of fire blight, which is going to be one of the main problems with Asian pears. Uh, it's it's a, a tree that we really like to recommend for a lot of our sites in the Kansas City area because they do grow so well, they're more tolerant of soils, and also they're a narrower tree. You're talking at a about 12 feet wide, which is really pretty doable in, in, some of the, in some of the narrow lots where we plant these. <clears throat> uh, so uh, cherry varieties, and I, I mentioned black gold because it is a, a nice uh, self-fertile variety. The Montmorency is sort of your typical pie cherry. That's uh, that's the, the pie cherry that they, they raise up in Michigan. Uh, it also grows really well around here. Basically, it's, it, it grows to about the 15-foot level. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the Danube and the, and, the, and the Jubilium in here, and these are a cross uh, between the sweet and tart. They're part of the Hungarian uh, uh, cherry breeding program that then got brought to Michigan and then is now uh, sort of nationwide, these cherries are being planted, and they do quite well in our area. And then uh, I, I bring in the, uh, the Romance bush cherries, and this is a series of, uh, of bush cherries that was actually developed by the University of Saskatchewan uh, for cold tolerance to have some sort of crop that, that they could actually market up in Saskatchewan. Well, it turns out these also do really well here. You would think that, that they would have a problem with heat tolerance. They do not. Um, these, are, these are shrubs that grow to about the five to six foot level, and the cherries are born underneath the foliage. So you lift up the foliage, and you see the cherries in there. So they're kind of masked from the birds, too, which can be one of the major problems with trying to cultivate cherries in our area. Uh, they have a wonderful flavor. They're, they're definitely on the tart side, but they do have that good sweetness with them as well. And currently, these are the only two that you can, 
you can find in the states. Um, due to a lot of patenting rights, uh, we can't bring any of the other series in to the U.S. yet. But there, there's a there's a, a list of five or six other varieties other than Carmine Jewel and Crimson Passion. There's a Romeo. There's a Juliet. That's why they call it the Romance series. <clears throat> So European pears, uh, they, they come highly recommended for our area. They're, they're almost foolproof with the exception of fire blight, um, thing, things like the, uh, the Bartlett pear. While Bartlett has such a wonderful taste and is a great producer, it succumbs to fire blight and you could lose a tree, a whole tree in one year. So all of these varieties are, are nice blight resistant varieties. Peaches. Uh, everybody loves a fresh peach, and uh, they, they actually grow really well around here. Last year sort of wasn't the best year for peaches because we had such cold weather in the spring. They were flowering when it was right around that, uh, right around 33, 34 degrees, so they actually did not get pollinated well. Um, but for the most part, these four varieties listed here, you can have... Uh, a continual harvest until late August. So Haro Diamond is the first peach that ripens around our area. And this also is another Canadian introduction that happens to do really well around here. Uh, Haro D Diamond on good years will ripen in late June, but most years it's going to be the first week of July. And then you get into Contender Alberta Starfire and like I say, you'll, you'll have continual production of peaches through mid-August, late August. So blackberries, there are, uh, well, there are a number of different varieties, um, and there are also the thorny varieties. Uh, we recommend thornless varieties, and for obvious reasons. They're, they're so much easier to take care of. Uh, with thorny varieties, while you may get great berry size, the size of your thumb, um, you're also going to lose a little bit of blood from your thumb as you're picking them. So, uh, so uh, I recommend these varieties here. Uh, Natchez is going to be your earliest ripening blackberry. And what is, becomes especially important about this, this is actually a blackberry that uh, it ripens before the spotted wing Drosophila comes out. And if, if you haven't heard about the spotted wing Drosophila, you're going to hear about it today. Uh, it's a little fruit fly that actually oviposits into fruit. So these ripen before the fruit fly begins its cycle. Uh, Apache, unfortunately, it ripens after that cycle gets started. If you don't have the spotted wing, great, you can grow Apache. Um, the nice thing about both Natchez and Apache, they are going to be what's called a more erect growing blackberry. They're not going to be a trailing blackberry. Uh, Chester, which you actually see in the picture here, is a trailing blackberry. Uh, the deal with trailing blackberries is you just have to trellis them that much more. So what that means is you still have to trellis the Natchez and Apache, but you, you just have to be aware that Chester's going to grow a little bit more robustly, and you're going, you may have to have a stronger wire uh, on your trellis. Blueberries, uh, everybody wants to grow them. Not everybody can grow them. You can grow them if you prepare your soil. And, and that is, uh, you know, that's, that's the biggest key there. And you really have to start on your soil probably a year before. Uh, so most of our soils, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be in that, that 7 to 7.5 range on the pH. Well, blueberries love 4.5 to 5.5. Um, there aren't too many soils that are naturally that low. We do a lot of uh, soil tests when we put in these orchards. And, and we did have one soil come back at a 5.4. And I thought, wow, that's, that's great. We are gonna, going to have to, to grow blueberries, but most of them are in the 7 to 7.5 range. So how do you get that soil down? Um, starting about a year before, 
go ahead and excavate the existing soil. Then start putting in peat moss and mixing it in with your existing soil. Add elemental, elemental sulfur in with your peat moss and your existing soil. And constantly, every three months, check the pH on your soil. And, and hopefully by a year, it'll probably be more like 18 months, it'll be brought down to a level that the blueberries will be able to tolerate. Another thing about blueberries too, is they do not have, uh, they don't have an extensive root system. So you do have to have some sort of drip irrigation or you have to have a heavy mulch on those blueberries. Uh, their root system does not come very far out from the plant. That being said, these varieties actually do quite well in the area. The, low, the difference between low bush and the high bush, the low bush are going to be a smaller blueberry as well as a smaller plant. The plants actually adapt a lot better to our environment. They, they, uh, they grow uh, with uh, stoloniferous growth, so, so they're right there rooting in and growing. Uh, the high bush, it does take a little while longer to get established you will get larger blueberries. Uh, the Chandler especially, you'll have blueberries almost the diameter of a quarter off of these, and that, that is just really impressive. Currants and gooseberries uh, uh, are somewhat suited. I mean, there are, of course, the, uh, the native, uh, native gooseberries that you see out on the fringes of the woods. They do great around here. Sure, they get burned out a little bit, in the heat of the summer. They do succumb to some fungal issues, um, but they do well. The picture in the background is actually a clove currant, and clove currant probably does better than, than any other variety of currant and or gooseberry around. Um, clove currant has a wonderful smell. This is really nicely adapted for more of the ornamental landscape. Um, it has the fragrance of lilac, maybe even a little bit spicier than a lilac. Uh, the shrubs, if, if let go, will get to be six, seven feet tall, but are readily pruned back. Uh, the flowers will last for sometimes a month. Um, it is both a Missouri and Kansas native, too, which, which having a native plant background I can really appreciate. There is uh, a variety of the clove currant called Crandall that is, uh, it will lie flat on the ground because it's so heavy with berry production. And if you're really interested in currants, um, of course, currants, you're, you're sort of limited with what you can do. You can, you can dry them or you can make preserves, jellies, things like that. But if you're interested, Crandall is probably the best variety. Um, the sort of pinkish white on the inset there is the, uh, is the, the, the pink champagne, which has a wonderful flavor and it does, it tastes just like the name suggests. And this is, uh, uh, this, I believe, is Hinamaki red on the, on, the, uh, on the gooseberry. Another thing, the difference between uh, gooseberries and currants, if you don't know, I mean, it's, it boils down to thorns. Gooseberries have thorns, currants do not. Of course, there's a lot more to that, but that's, if you're just to take a look at them, uh, that would be the quickest way. So strawberries. Um, strawberries are great. Uh, great for either the uh, um, ornamental landscape or if you're going to do production. I would do strawberries in raised beds. Make sure those raised beds are going to be somewhere where you're not bending over um, because you can see there's a lot of bending over when you pick strawberries. Basically strawberries uh, are separated into two different categories. You have the June bearing which they bear more or less between May 15th and June 15th. And then you have the everbearing. Now everbearing is also day neutral. So don't, don't think they're two separate things, they are the same thing. Uh, everbearing means they will continue to bear throughout the growing season. So you'll get your initial flush in June, May to June. Then you'll have sort of some subsequent uh, cropping in July, August, and then you'll get a crop right before frost. Those crops are never as big as, as your initial June flush. And the other, the other thing about the everbearing 
is because they're constantly sort of putting forth uh, flowers and fruits, they're not putting in that much vegetative growth. So if you get a summer that's incredibly hot, those strawberries are going to burn out. Now that being said, those two varieties listed up there under Everbearing, those are going to be the more tolerant of our summer strawberries. Uh, those varieties can handle that nine, those 90 plus days. Um, that being said, no strawberry is perfectly happy at, at 90 degrees or above. Uh, the Cavendish Early Glow Sure Crop, those, those grow uh, really well around here. And if anything, uh, if, if you do get into the June bearers, then it's about strawberry management and thinning and, and thinning out the mother plants and allowing for the daughter plants to come in. And that, that's a whole separate issue, but once you get into strawberries, you start to realize that. Uh, I, I really like uh, the, the unusual fruits because this, this is a chance to uh, delve into something that most people do not know about, aren't familiar with. Uh, pawpaws, while they're native to the area, uh, how many people have tried pawpaws? If I could just get a show of hands. Okay, so yeah, I, I figured it would be right around the, the five to ten. Um, so pawpaws, also known as we are on the Kansas side, the Kansas banana, but they're known as the Missouri banana, they're known as the Pennsylvania banana. Whatever state sort of east of, uh, east of Colorado, it's the banana um, because it does have a flavor much like a banana. Uh, it has a, a very, uh, very smooth texture and actually they're, they're ripe sort of when they start to get that yellowish to black, which isn't very appetizing. You never see pawpaws at a grocery store, and you will rarely see them at a farmer's market. Um, but there are varieties out there that can be grown that produce quite well. Uh, most of the pawpaws out in the native stands are not going to produce very well. They flower early enough uh, that there aren't too many pollinators out, and they do, uh, they're self-infertile. And the way pawpaws grow in nature, they, they form these clonal masses and a clonal mass will not be self-fertile. It needs pollen from another clonal mass that will then um, pollinate those. So, uh, so that being said, plant two varieties and plant cultivated varieties because the cultivated varieties are going to yield bigger fruits. Both Shenandoah and Susquehanna will yield fruits upwards of a pound and they have less seeds. That's sort of been, been the problem with the native pawpaws too. Their, their uh, sort of flesh to seed ratio is pretty much equal. So you want more flesh to seed. Uh, then, then a little note about jujubes. And the jujubes are, are there in the inset. Now, how many people have tried jujubes? Okay, I hear the crickets. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, so, so jujubes are also known as the Chinese date. Uh, there are over 600 cultivated varieties of these in China. Uh, they happen to be one of these plants that does really well in our area. Uh, the drought of 2012, they handled it. They were rock stars. They have a nice glossy leaf. Uh, glossy leaf tends to indicate drought tolerance. Um, so anyhow, these uh, will put on fruits and you see the various stage of ripening. Basically, you want to pick them as they start to get that kind of mahogany color. So you bite into a jujube, it is crisp, it is sweet. It's, it's, like, it's like crisp sugar, um, a, a very wonderful. They have a pit that's an awful lot like an olive. Um, see, the three varieties that I'm recommending, cocoa actually tastes like coconut. It has a hint of coconut in the flavor. Uh, Lang is going to be sort of a pear shape, but, but much smaller. And then Lee is going to be the biggest jujube you can grow. And you're looking at golf ball size. But once these trees reach maturity, they'll put on about 40 to 100 pounds a year. And, and at this point, they're very pest, uh, pest free. Uh, really don't know of any pests that will get into them. Uh, you will have an occasional bird peck, 
but even the birds don't know what to think about them because they are really somewhat solid and the birds can't get in there that well. It's not like a big red apple which a bird can, can really do some damage on. Persimmons, um, not, once again, not too terribly unusual uh, seeing as they do grow in native stands around here. Uh, but most of the native persimmons are small. You do have to wait until after that first freeze. Uh, they, they really have to stay on the tree to lose some of that astringency uh, because I'm sure people have been tricked by the, oh yeah, try this, and it's a, a not ripe persimmon and you've, you're scraping off the fuzz in your mouth for the next week. Um, so these persimmons do really well in our area, produce year after year. Nikita's gift is a hybrid between the, the big Japanese persimmons that you'll see in the markets and the American persimmon. The size is, is going to be like a large American persimmon, but it has more, the flesh to seed ratio, once again, is very high. Um, and, and it ripens, it can stay on the tree after frost and it does sweeten. Early golden actually ripens in August, which, uh, you know, people would, would tell you you'd be crazy to try a persimmon in August. This is good in August. And then Garretson uh, is just a heavy producer. Uh, out at Powell, we had a tree that was probably six, seven feet tall, had over 100 persimmons on it. Um, so if, if you're thinking about those, uh, once again, great. Now, now persimmons, uh, they do require a pollinizer, so a male persimmon, uh, with the exception of Nikita's gift. Nikita's gift is self-fertile. A little bit about figs. You can grow them, and, and I'm sure people have had figs in the audience. Have you had figs off of your own fig bush? Uh, yes, you can do that around here. Now, uh, figs are are a little tricky, not too tricky though. You grow them like you would a perennial. So they get the new wood starting in basically mid-April and they grow, they'll grow into a shrub and then they start to put the figs on as you see right off of the branch there. Um, depending on the variety, those figs will start ripening in August. Now the varieties that uh, I like to grow uh, are, are these varieties listed? Hardy Chicago is going to be the first to produce for you, and so you'll have figs from, from basically August to October. First frost, the thing's toast. Um, it, it just looks like a collection of sticks. But you have the wonderful scent of coconut after that because that's sort of a byproduct of the foliage, and you wonder what's smelling like coconut. It's the fig. Um, so Peter's Honey, Stella, and Really Delightful are going to be ripening later. Now some winters, your, uh, your, uh, the twigs on your figs will overwinter. Um, this winter, probably not, because we have been below zero for enough days, enough hours, that the, the plant is probably dying back to the ground and will reemerge in the spring. Um, that being said, if you have a little microclimate, maybe the twigs have overwintered. The nice thing about overwintering twigs is you get the, what's called the breba crop on the figs, and that's uh, sort of an earlier cropping. So, uh, so some people, especially the folks that have been growing figs in the area for a while, they'll actually wrap their, their plants uh, in blankets or they'll pack them with straw. They will do anything they can to insulate the figs. Some people will bend the branches down and, and mound over with soil. So there are, there are a lot of different techniques for growing figs. Uh, the, the, the important takeaway from this is you can grow them in our area. How, when should I sort of stop here? Okay, I, I, did, I didn't know. I knew we were running behind, but... Uh, I'd, um, okay, elderberries. Uh, anybody tried elderberries? Elderberry syrup, elderberry wine. Uh, elderberry cough syrup, uh, elderberry honey. So Missouri is actually leading the charge, at least in the United States, as far as uh, elderberry development and elderberry markets. Um, elderberry is another one of our native plants. 
that has been uh, cultivated for use for a number of years, but it's, it's gaining traction now. Um, so these varieties, uh, they, they produce larger berries, and basically that's what you're after. Um, I'm trying to think which variety it is. One of these varieties, the flowers actually, actually droop down, which turns out to be beneficial from keeping the birds off of the plant. Uh, but, but all of these varieties grow very well. Uh, the way you harvest your elderberries is you actually cut the cluster off and freeze it. You don't pick the elderberries off or you've, you've just juiced your elderberries all over you. Um, so, and then, and then once you do that, you can go ahead and cook them down and, and make whatever you want to, either have it, have it, have it be a mixed spread, uh, mix it in with honey, um, add it to smoothies, uh, what have you. Very attractive plant in flower, too. Service berries, another very attractive plant. Uh, one, one of the earlier fruits uh, that we have around this area, too. The, the service berry flowers very early in the spring, pretty much before the red buds, um, and very showy. And then you get the resultant fruits that typically ripen late May, early June. Autumn Brilliance is pretty much a landscape shrub. I mean, you could find that, uh, I'm sure it's on campus here, and you could find it at, at pretty much ev almost every suburban development now, which is great. Um, so, so you can go out and, and do a little, uh, a little harvesting. Um, and people will look at you, why are you eating that? Well, they're really tasty. They taste like blueberries, honestly. Uh, they just have a few more seeds inside of them. Um, so Autumn Brilliance is a hybrid between our true native service berry and a northern service berry. And then the, uh, the Smoky and Teeson are, uh, are uh, cultivars of the northern service berry, which actually puts on a bigger berry. Uh, they don't do as well around here, but if situated sort of in the right cooler microclimate, they can produce well. Aronia berry is also kind of another big thing, and this is actually uh, more in the northern plains than it is here. But aronia berry, also known as chokeberry, has been grown uh, uh, really uh, for the landscape industry or by the landscape industry and nurseries for a number of years. Uh, I remember early on planting these as foundation shrubs because they have wonderful flowers, uh, great fall color. You get a lot of reds and burgundies and a good berry show. And, and that was sort of promoted as for the birds, for the wildlife. Um, but these are also great, once again, for uh, sort of the post-harvest production. So you would be turning this into jams and jellies. Aronia berry is used a lot more in Europe than it is here. It's very high in antioxidants. So, uh, so it, it's used in a lot of the European sort of fruit drinks and sodas. You'll even find it in some of the... Uh, some of the sodas around, uh, around here in the States as well. These three varieties all produce uh, larger quantities of berries. So not only a large quantity, but a larger berry too. Uh, I currently have a bunch of them sitting in the freezer and I just mix them in with, with the, the banana yogurt strawberry smoothie. And uh, it lends a really nice color. They do have a little bit of a tart taste to them. And they are very astringent if they're picked early. Uh, basically, you can pick these sort of uh, right before first frost and right after first frost. The Cornelian cherry dogwood, another great ornamental, but also a good fruit producer. Uh, when in doubt, turn it into a jam or jelly. Uh, that's sort of a, a little bit of a motto. Um, but you have a great looking dogwood, and this is not your typical dogwood that you're thinking of. Uh, this is pretty much the first thing to flower around here. Uh, you have your reticulated iris that flower pretty early. This flowers basically right after the reticulated iris. Um, so this flowers before the forsythia. People may think this being a forsythia. It's not. So, so it puts on a, a great flower show, and then you get the resultant berries. Now the berries, you have to wait until they, uh, until they fall off the tree to really lose their astringency, but once they have, they're a really 
really nice flavor. A lot of pectin in them too, so they, they work out well for, for mixing in with jams and jellies. And the varieties listed, Red Star, Red Dawn, and Yellow Fruited are all going to be bigger fruits. So sort of more bang to the buck. You're not going to get the floral show. And that's sort of kind of the theme. You don't get the floral show when you get the bigger fruits. You know, it's kind of like with crab apples. You get a lot of small fruits, um, but you get a good floral show. With apple trees, you get about a week of flowering, but you get huge fruits. So same, same with Cornelian cherries. And then nuts. Um, one of these days we'll be able to grow this uh, in, in our backyard. I know some nurseries are selling this for little microclimate areas. Uh, this, this is the monkey puzzle tree in the background. And if you've either been to Chile or Peru, you, you probably know about it. But even going out to the west coast, this is sort of cultivated as a nut tree. Um, and and it, it, it gets to be huge. Uh, it's, it's truly a zone seven, uh, but it does have nice harvestable nuts. Um, so the reality of the situation is we, we have pecans that we can grow well around here. Uh, we have chestnuts that can grow well around here. Just give them a nice sandy alluvial soil. Uh, we have hardy almonds and the peach almond hybrids. Now, who thought you could grow almonds around here? Yes, you can. And there is, there is one particular one that we're growing. Uh, we grow it out at PAL. We're growing it with the Giving Grove as well. It's called Reliable, and it's one of the peach almond hybrids. It looks like a peach, flowers like a peach. It puts on little peaches, but you wait for those little peaches to fall off the tree, and you realize the, the flesh on them is, is maybe a quarter inch. It's what's inside. It's what's inside the husk on that nut, and well, getting down, and, and that's the little tiny hardy almond uh, that is, it's smaller than the true California almonds that we're all familiar with, but it tastes just the same. Um, and it grows really well around here. Reliable is a very good name for it. Uh, hazelnuts, of course, we have the, the native hazelnut that you'll, you'll see kind of in the, in the upper wooded sections of, of some of the, the natural areas around. Uh, but then there are the cultivated varieties. And um, the cultivated varieties, and I, I have the, the list uh, on the sheet of paper, but basically what you're looking for is something that's going to be uh, blight resistant because there's the eastern filbert blight, filbert hazelnut, same thing. Um, so you want to have something blight resistant because we are in the region where we can get filbert blight. And then there are pine nuts. Now we can't grow the true, uh, the true southwestern pinon pine. We're just not the right climate. But you can grow the lace bark pine, which is actually used in a lot of landscapes. Those nuts are edible, albeit small. Uh, and you can grow the Korean pine. And the Korean pine is going to take a while, uh, and, and I really only know of very few Korean pines in our area. I'm sure there's some tucked away in people's backyards here and there, but you can get nuts off of those, and those are a much larger pine nut. They're a very attractive tree, too. They have a nice glaucousy blue silver. So here we are on the hazelnuts. Uh, I also just threw in some of the ornamental ones as well. You have the Rodzeller, which is the purple one. Uh, you have uh, uh, Aria, which is uh, grafted on a standard there. Um, and then, then just out there in sort of the hazelnut orchard, you, you see some of the other varieties. Basically a 12 by 15 foot shrub. There's the, uh, the Rodzeller again. So I'm about wrapped up, but I, I do also want to talk a little bit about uh, the role of, of some of the companion plantings. And, and there is truth to companion plantings. And this is not just from sort of the pollinator perspective, but having some of these plants around actually inhibits things that grow in the soil. This is, uh, this is a plant called Tegetes minuta which is a, a small flowered marigold, small flowered but rather tall marigold. Uh, this acts as an nematicidal in the soil. 
Uh, a lot of nematodes can, can really wreak havoc with blackberries, with um, uh, currants, with gooseberries. So this acts as a nematicidal. Those roots get out there and, and the nematodes do not like it. They move on. Uh, things like chamomile, uh, they help break the soil up, make for a more friable soil. Uh, not only is this a great herb to be using, but it, it provides benefits to the soil. It also helps transfer calcium throughout your soil. And things like uh, sunflowers. So sunflowers uh, are, are actually really important uh, in your orchard. And this comes from the perspective of trying to manage things like oriental fruit moth and lesser peach tree borers. Um, basically, there is a, there's a braconid wasp that it hosts on a moth that eats sunflower heads. And so this braconid wasp will set up camp and will overwinter in, in, the, in, the, marth, in the moth larva and then it'll emerge the next year and it will start to work in your orchard on the larva of the oriental fruit moth of the lesser peach tree borer. Uh, this is also the case with strawberries too. That same braconid wasp will, will also host on the strawberry leaf roller and then will alternately host on something like your oriental fruit moth. So planting something as simple as sunflowers can bring in some of those some of those beneficial insects that, that you wouldn't necessarily think about. And this is all a, part, uh, all a part of sort of a healthy orchard dynamic. And this is something that, that we're definitely trying to promote, not only at Powell Gardens, but also with the Giving Grove. And then, of course, just something for pollinators, too. You know, having, having the sort of large floral area, flowers that will last, you know, six weeks rather than two days, something that has nectaries. Uh, all of this is important too and, and just helps with the orchard dynamic. Uh, so with that, if, uh, if you have any questions, feel free, I, I can answer. I, I know we're, we're running short on time. Uh, and once again, I do have uh, the list of, of different uh, fruit selections if you're interested as well as uh, business cards too. So thank you very much. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so, so what can you do to, to revive an apple tree? And in some cases, you can prune it back quite a bit. I mean, it, it, it depends on how far gone the apple tree is. In some cases, so apple trees will succumb to a, a wide variety of bores. Um, and, and we're not just talking the, uh, the, the, the round-headed, we're talking flat-headed, we're talking shot hole, we're talking uh, a, a bunch of different bore species that can start to take the apple tree down. Um, after that, uh, if, if you don't have too much of that going on, you can remove any of the dead wood. Oftentimes, really cutting a tree back by three quarters, you'll get some rejuvenating growth on it. Um, then it's a matter of training that rejuvenated growth. But, but find out what your problem is. If you, if you have something like fire blight in the tree, you really have to prune out a lot of that tree. Um, Ideally, you're coming down eight inches to a foot below where you see the damaged tissue from the fire blight. Um, so, you know, that, that's sort of one of, the, one of the problems with most orchards, most fruit trees, is they really have a short life. We're talking 20 to 50 years. Uh, they're not going to have the longevity of, of an oak, of a hickory, things like that. So, so sometimes you, uh, you, you really do have to literally cut your losses and, and start anew. But you, you, can, you can rejuvenate at the same point. Okay, one more question. Yeah. Um, in general, is there a list of fruits that will or will not uh, lose a product? Like, you know, a lot of people are going to think that they're going to die off. 
Right. Um, you know, actually, most of uh, most of the fruit trees are fairly compatible. Um, I mean, other than from a shade perspective, that would be that would be where the uh, incompatibility lies. But the jug loan, um, I'm trying. I mean, it's, it it affects more of your herbaceous layer. So as far as uh, things within things within the bean family, um, things within the aster family, that's going to be where your main bugaboo is. Um, so. But but as far as the uh, like the the you know your blackberries your blueberries uh, your apples peaches pears no no there's there's not a toxicity issue there. So. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you. Thank you.